Shy Ford, Bach is here. Uh, Mr. Farley, the black shirt is here. Good can morning. I, good morning. Can good I, morning. Can I call him the black shirt coach? Sure. Okay. I just want to make sure because I just want to know if I earned the right to be called a black shirt coach. <laughs> I I would say many times over. Thank yeah. you, sir. It's a great honor to have you here today, Coach. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Good to be here. Absolutely. So, Coach, we at Wing Stop. I know I'm. I am going to go right into it. It's game week. There's two days in the wake up, and then it'll be game time in Dublin. Um, if you were prepared for a game, what would Monday look like and what would the week look like? Well, probably, Vershawn, on a normal week, um, you you haven't had a whole lot of time because you played the previous Saturday. And, and with the first game, that's not true. You know, you've got a, a better part of four weeks to get ready. And uh, so it's probably a little different. But normally on a on a Monday, normal season game, You'd probably uh, put in anything new that you were going to put in, offensive, defensive. Um, probably being helmets and shoulder pads, you wouldn't do a whole lot of hitting, but uh, a pretty thorough practice, but uh, more more mental. And then uh, after that, Tuesday, Wednesday were really hard practices, full pads, some contact. Thursday, back off a little bit, sweat clothes. And then Friday, uh, just kind of a walk through. So we always tried to work hard in the middle of the week and then get them back by by uh, Friday, Saturday and uh, have their legs under them. And so, uh, but it'll be a little different over there. And of course, they're adjusting to a new, a new environment. There'll be some sightseeing and you're hoping the players don't get distracted too much. And um, so, uh, but I've, I've been down and watched them a couple of times and they they looked the part more than they have, and uh, and I think Scott feels fairly confident. And I I would have to echo his sentiments that um, this is a better football team. Uh, the schedule's probably uh, you never know you know how strong the schedule's going to be, but at least on paper, looks a little more favorable than last year. Who when when you look at this game, if you were going to script the first five plays, what would you script? Well, I'd probably, probably. Well, I'll just tell you what what I normally did. I usually scripted the first thirteen, fourteen plays, and we'd probably be in a different formation every play. And because uh, you'll you'll normally find uh, that a, a team will focus more on certain things, and if we found that we came out in a formation and they didn't seem to be lined up very well against it then we'd make mental note of that and then come back to it and start attacking them in, in areas that they seem to be a little bit weak when they, when they lined up. Now, how, how uh, uh, Whipple will approach the game, I don't know. have no idea. But I think probably somewhat similarly, he'll, he'll probably be in several formations early and uh, give them some motion and some shifting and just see if there's some things that he – but. You know, you're going to find that Northwestern defensively will be pretty sound. They're they're not going to line up and beat themselves, and uh, and they usually have pretty good players up front. And uh, so the big thing I think in this game is going to be turnovers. Uh, Nebraska probably will have a better team, but if you go minus two turnovers, <laughs> it's anybody's ball game. You go minus three turnovers, and uh, you're probably going to lose. And uh, so that's always the, the nerve-wracking thing, particularly in a first game, because you're not totally sure how people are going to react under uh, game situation. When, when you're talking about turnovers, how many points to you is a turnover worth? Is that, is that worth any points? Is it worth three points, you know what I mean, in the grand scheme of a game when you turn that ball over? is that mm -hmm. Do most teams turn those into points? Yeah, I would I would think it'd be worth uh, somewhere in the four or five point range, because uh, if you don't turn it over and you just punt the ball, that's 40 yards that you're going to pick up. And that's the thing that people don't really understand about uh, about football is uh, field position is a big deal. And you sit in the stands and it doesn't really register with you. But I used to be on the uh, college football playoff uh, selection committee, and we had all kinds of data. But the thing that I eventually came to focus on was primarily field position 
and uh, what happened every change of possessions. And usually the top four teams at the end of the year were plus four, plus five, plus six yards every time there was a change of possessions. And sometimes, and that was a lot of it was kicking. Sometimes it was turnovers. Sometimes it was penalties. But they just operated more efficiently. And in the course of a game, if you pick up five yards per change of possessions and there's 15 possessions, you know, that, that adds up to seven to ten points. And uh, so usually the, the top four teams at the end of the year that go into the college football playoff are going to be people who are pretty efficient and uh, they have a good kicking game. And I think this year uh, there's been a lot more focus on kicking. And I think Bill Bush will be quite a fine addition there. I think they're putting their best players out there. You know, we used to have Terrell, and uh, we, we had guys that could run and tackle. And uh, and so, you know, we, we just felt – and we had, we had guys like Grant Wistrom on the on the punt team, and these are guys who were All-American, maybe going to be first-round draft picks. But we felt that the kicking game was so so critical that you had to have your best players on the field. What was that – when you talk about that point total – what is the kicking game point total worth to you as far as, you know, the different facets of the game? Well, the you know, it, there's another team out there too. So if they have a good kicking game and you have a good kicking game, it's probably a net zero. But if they have a real good kicking game and you don't, then you're probably minus 10, minus 14 points. And if you look at last year, uh, we fair caught the ball almost every punt return. And so we were losing probably seven to 10 yards per exchange just on no punt return. And uh, I think they've got better punt returners this year, some guys that they're pretty confident in. And so if you can break one or two during the season and, and then get substantial returns uh, steadily throughout the game, it's going to make a big difference. Now, Coach, they asked uh, Scott Frost to take a, a CEO role. Now, mm -hmm. the CEO role as a head coach, is that walking to, from station to station to station to station every every day, checking on players, and, and how did that go when they asked you to take that CEO role? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what that means exactly, but <clears throat> it means, number one, that he probably won't be calling the plays. And uh, you know, if you're calling the plays, then you really have to immerse yourself in the in the offense and i i probably spent 30 hours a week uh looking at film and quite often by myself to try to get a feel for how that opposing defensive coordinator was going to behave in different situations if it's third and long uh, and we're down deep in our own territory what's he going to do if we're on the it's third down and five going in what's he going to do and so you begin to get a feel for the game. And so Scott will be freed up more to uh, uh, relate to the players, uh, go around, visit with them, spend a little time with them in the weight room, and, and probably will be able to sit in once in a while with the defense. I tried to sit in with the defense one hour every, every morning, and we look at the preceding day's practice. So I was pretty much up to speed on what, what happened the day before, and what we were going to do, but if you're uh, immersing yourself in the offense, uh, that's a full-time job. That's probably about 80 hours in a, in a week, and you probably spend 90, sometimes 100 hours getting ready for a game. So it's um, it's, a, it's a job where you don't sleep a whole lot. <laughs> I, I know that's right, Coach. So, Coach, by the time my senior year came, 1997. It didn't seem to me that you used the – like, you know, you see the coaches with the play cards and they got mm -hmm. real small and they got – when you call the plays, were, were those plays called from the top of your mind or did you kind of know what you were going to call? I mean, as the game progressed. Well, <clears throat> I, I mentioned that I tried to look at a lot of film. And, you know, we did have a, a, a game sheet, a chart, and long yardage goal line uh, – long yardage, short yardage, all these things. But eventually that ended up in my back pocket. <laughs> and so uh, I, I, I tried to have a good enough feel 
for the way the game was going, what the guy was going to do on the other side, that I was able to do it quickly. And, and so what we didn't run a hurry up, no huddle offense, but we tried to run pretty fast. We tried to make sure that we snapped the ball with at least 14, 15 seconds left on the game clock. And if we did that, we put more pressure on that defense to get lined up. We did, we began to wear them down. And usually by the fourth quarter, with a good running game, good offensive line, we were you know, those four or five yard plays in the first quarter were turned into seven and eight, nine yards. And so um, tried to run plays pretty quickly. And if you're constantly looking at a, a sheet, and, and you're trying to figure out what to do, and then you get the play called. You're, you're slowing things down too much. Did that? Did you, did you get? Obviously, you got better over time. Okay, so how important is it able to adjust on the fly? Well, I, I think it's critical that you be able to adjust because um, eventually, um, if you come out and start hurting people with something, they're going to adjust, and then you have to be able to adjust to their adjustment and. Off times that went went on mostly at halftime, but you know there, I had good people upstairs. Milt Tanner was on the phone, and Frank Solich, and uh, and so we were constantly uh, communicating as to what we were seeing, and and usually the worst seat in the house is what the what the football coach has because he's standing on the sideline, and so sometimes I'd look out there and all I would see would be. Uh, four, five, six defensive players. But from that, I had to figure out what they were actually lined up in because I, I didn't have the overview from up above. And But I uh, was able to talk to Milt and others, and uh, and that was very helpful. First play of the game, tight right, 42 die. <laughs> well, it could be. Who I'm, knows? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying if, 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 okay, we got your best offense out there, what's your, what's your call? First play of the game. We playing. We playing Northwestern. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know. I my guess is that uh, you come with something uh, that that uh, you know we a pitch play average about six yards, seven yards a play, and uh, that's where we pulled the onside guard and fullback filled up in there. So I'd say something like that be first play and just see how they line up. And sometimes people fool you because I remember one time we played Kansas and it was about the eighth or ninth game of the season. And we looked at every game they played, every snap they took. And and they came out in a eight-man front and their defensive backs were within two yards of the line of scrimmage, something we'd never seen before, you know, and they'd never shown it. And so we we're, we're kind of scrambling at that point as to, where we go, but the the thing about it that over time, we sort of had a, a collective memory. We'd say, well, you know, we saw something like this four years ago when we played TCU, and we know this hurt them. And so, institutional knowledge is very helpful, and that's really good to to have an experienced staff that's been together for a long period of time. We 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 go out, we win the toss. Mm -hmm. What what do you do? You you receive or you kick off? Well, probably the the first thing that you're if you win the win the toss, you're gonna you're gonna take the football, and uh, if you lose the toss, and they take the football, then obviously you're gonna defend. But then you have the you the nice thing is you have the ball in and the it starts the second half, and usually by the second half. You're a little bit better into the game, you know, a little bit more what you're going to see. Because a lot of people don't change much from the first half to the second half. Now, we tried to adjust quite a bit during halftime. And we oftentimes would come out and doing some stuff almost entirely different than what we showed in the, in the first half. And I think that was always advantageous for us. Now, Coach, on the defensive side um, today, I read um, they only gave out nine black shirts. What, I mean, my feeling towards that is that 11 black shirts should be given out for the game because mm -hmm. you got 11 starters. And I think one of the excuses was that the player has never started a game here before. How, was Is that a big concern for you that they only gave out nine black shirts? 
Well, I, I wouldn't say it's a concern one way or another. I, I suppose what they're trying to get at is that you have to reach a certain level of performance and proficiency to earn a black shirt. And they must have had a couple guys that they thought were the best at their position, but they still weren't performing quite like they wanted. And so that can serve as motivation. But on the other hand, you might say, well, I'm, I'm the one of only two guys out there without a yeah, black shirt. I think so you kind of make them feel left out. How, how good am I, you know? So that's, that's kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah. And uh, But we, we usually hand it out about 11, sometimes 12 or 13 black shirts because we'd, we'd have a nickel back or somebody that would go out there and play as many snaps, but he wouldn't necessarily be the starter, you know. But, you know, it's, it's just a matter of, how coaches want to interpret things. Now, me and Vijay had a debate the other day. How many black shirts did – I mean, you. just at the end of the year. You said – no, you said 11 to 12. But I think, like, when we played, we had, like, around 15 to 17 black shirts mm -hmm. at the end of the year. Well, I knew we had more than 11. I didn't yeah, know so we had 15 to 17. <laughs> so. Well, we had Phil and Doug that were starting. They were uh -huh. switching in and out. Then you had uh, me and Twilliger. That they, we were switching in and out. Jamel and Jay Foreman. Mm -hmm. So that was like that's six right there. That's just the linebackers group. Right. So you're thinking of the DBs with the four with, and then you probably add Eric Stokes. Mm -hmm. You know, because he was you know basically like a starter to us. And then on the defensive line, so I'm counting at least thirteen to fourteen. Oh yeah, yeah, I'd say thirteen, fourteen, I mean, easy, I mean, maybe fifteen, yeah. But again, we I guess you're just looking at players. Have they risen to a certain level of proficiency? And can do you feel like you can put them out there and you're not going to drop off hardly at all? You know, they're, they're, they're a starter, even though they may not have started the game. They're playing like a starter. And um, so, and I imagine that will happen this year, too. I imagine that, you know, uh, next game you'll probably see 11 black shirts and maybe eventually you'll see – 12 or 13, but we really had some good players too, though. And uh, we were very strong on defense and very strong on offense. And that made a big difference. And of course, a guy like you, you're, you're uh, fast. You could cover backs out of the backfield, you know. And, uh, and then you also held up one again, well against the run. And you were best, uh, best punt blocker. You know, you blocked four or five punts uh, every season and uh, so you're a very versatile player and uh, helps to have a guy like that around coach how important what is a black shirt what does that mean to you just being a black shirt <laughs> well i guess you know i'll tell you a story how, how it came about uh, i was i was here when bob devaney came here and uh, we had a lot of players, you know, at that time the big, in the Big 8 Conference, you could give out 45 scholarships a year, and, uh, and there was no upper limit. So you had 150, 160 guys on scholarship, and, um, and that was one of the strengths of the Big 8 because we had more players on scholarship than anybody else. But anyway, uh, you'd have four teams, four offensive teams, four defensive teams, and so uh, they always put the uh, put the offense in red jerseys, and then defensively, Mike Corgan went down to the sporting goods store and he bought uh, pullover jerseys, and he bought some black jerseys, and some gold jerseys, and some green jerseys, and some white jerseys, and the first team got black shirts, and the second team had gold. And the third had green, and the fourth had white, and um, and that was simply for contrast. And then some somehow eventually, people said they started calling black shirts. Black shirts go here. Black shirts go there, and it, it came to mean more than just a, a pullover jersey. But that went clear back to 1962, and uh, <laughs> and what what the sporting goods store happened to had. In the in terms of pullover jerseys, so wasn't anything magical. Just something that happened. <laughs>